Hi everyone, I do hope you are all well and as you tune in to this time where I will be sharing the word of God with you, I do pray that the Lord will bless you, that this time will be a special time in God's presence for you, for us all as we come together. Today I want to speak from the Gospel of Matthew, so if you have your Bible please turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 13, I read from verse 31 to verse 34. I just want to speak a little bit about the kingdom of God today. Uh, I want to pick up a couple of things to expand on um, this theme because of what we spoke on the, or learned on the prayer course for those of you who were um, able to join us. Uh, we were talking about Thy kingdom come on Lord's Prayer. And we were focused about the intercessory prayer and how important that is. And also the effect that uh, our prayers have on the life of others. And how the Lord rejoices and he expects us to pray for us, to intercede for others. Our will plays a big role, free will plays a big role on our prayers. Us willing to pray for others. Is important indeed. Today I just thought um, to look a little bit more on the kingdom of God. What does the kingdom of God look like? And if we look at the book of Matthew chapter 13, um, we have here, and you will be glad to know, I will not be speaking about the seven parables that Jesus shares about the kingdom of God, um, I will mainly be focusing on the comparison that he makes of the kingdom of God and the mustard seed. Um, and also, it's kind of connected, really. I, I almost take it as one parable, because the next one it, it's, it has a, a lot of similarities which is the parable of the yeast. So these two is where I will be focusing mainly today. But if you have time, I do encourage you, read the whole chapter of uh, chapter 13 of Matthew and take your time, maybe have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and take your time and read them separately, one after the other, and take time to see what message they give you because you will be encouraged. You will see different angles of God's kingdom. And um, um, by God's grace, you will be able to understand a bit more, just like I have been. But I, I want to focus on these two in particular and see where the Lord takes us. So I am going to say a prayer and then I will read verses 31 to 34. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you that we could be here together. Lord, I pray that you will bless your word. Bless our hearts, Lord. May your spirit fill us afresh. And, oh, Lord, open our hearts, open our mind. Lord, we want to do your will. God, we want to be more like you. Jesus, I pray that you, you touch our hearts as we come to your word, oh God. Lord, bless your word. And give us ears to hear what you have to speak to us. In Jesus' name, I open this time. Amen. Amen. So here, the parable of mustard seed. He told them another parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Then Jesus told another parable of the yeast. He told them still another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that the woman took, mixed it into, into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all of these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. 
I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Just a little bit of introduction of chapter 13. As I said right at the beginning, um, Jesus is speaking seven parables here. And he's teaching the people who are around him, all of the crowds of people. He's teaching them in parables about the kingdom of God. And as we know, we, he starts with a, with a sower and the parable of the weeds. And then he comes down to the parable of mustard seed, the parable of um, yeast or leaven, whichever translation you have. And then he goes on to other areas where he says of the hidden treasure, the parable of the um, pearl, which has a great price, and, and a parable of the fishing nets. Again, great, um, great uh, teachings through them all. They have some similar differences which we can pick up from. But I want to particularly focus today on, on the parable of the mustard seed. It, it took my attention and I thought to myself, what is so special about this mustard seed that Jesus is even um, comparing his kingdom um, to it is God's kingdom he says is like a mustard seed what is so special about it um, I mean mustard seed is not like the um, uh, pearl with great value where um, one goes and, sh and sells everything in order to purchase that or buys the land or this hidden treasure to dig it out and find the treasure gives everything that the person have you wouldn't go and sell everything to buy a mustard seed or to plant it, a mustard tree. What is the significance of it all? If you read through um, different um, literature, if you like, you quickly will understand that mustard seed was also known like a common weed in the country of Israel. It grew absolutely everywhere. And um, it was considered to be a, one of those rubbish trees where no one really wanted them. It was a shrub. It was a weed that grew. I mean, it was not the mustard seed that would give any flavor to meat or flavor to um, vegetables or, or anything like that. It really did not... Um, give any benefit if you like it was a tree that grew it was a shrub that grew into a tree as the bible says but it did not have any benefit for the people of israel i obviously was was looking into it and trying to find trying to find a meaning uh, as to because it must have some some explanation as to why Jesus takes time to speak um, about his kingdom comparing it to a mustard seed. Of course, looking we all know that uh, looking at the char characteristic of the actual seed, the size of the seed is the smallest, as it says there, is the smallest of seeds which when planted uh, tends to grow and then it becomes bigger than all of the plants where their seed is bigger and it grows bigger than them and you know we know that to mean also as an example of our faith we need to have a faith as a mustard seed and then the Lord will take us from there and we can also pick up, I guess, on the our uh, proverb or, or saying that we have uh, often used and very, very famous, um, great things begin or come from small beginnings. You are all familiar with that. And yeah, we can preach on that. We can certainly, we can certainly build on that teaching. We can certainly build on that knowledge. And if we were to come from that um, uh, view, if you like, uh, we would take that then to mean it is an illustration where the church would be growing into great size by the work that the disciples 
and those who followed them would be doing. So they would start very small, you know, there were 12, um, well, turned out to be a little less than 12, um, but then as they uh, preached the good news, uh, certainly um, the, the church began to grow and so on and so forth. But as we look to it, um, I think there is, there is another meaning which I want to bring to you because looking at the book of Matthew, we know that one of the great themes that makes its introduction or, or, or um, begins in the book of Matthew is the inclusion of Gentiles to, um, um, to work together with, with the Jews. And that was a massive thing altogether. Now, although the mustard seed was not used or it simply was useless to the uh, Jews. It was not, uh, let's say Israel was not known by it as a, a type of tree that they are fond of, like palm trees or figs or, or olives. Those are the things that they, they uh, benefited from, things like that. But what does the Bible say, actually? Um, there's a few things that it says there which we can pick up on. It says, although that such shrub or a tree was not good to the Gentiles, sorry, to the Jews, it was good for something. It was really good for something. It grew, it says, to a point where the birds, it created a perfect place for the birds and where they would come and they would um, bring their young ones and grow them there. So that was... A very a great benefit for the birds and if we look through um, scripture and trying to understand I guess the stronger I'm trying to bring in birds were considered to be unclean they were characterized to be unclean and therefore could not be used by um, the, the uh, Jews but if you remember if you remember um, Peter he had a vision by God. And as he had a vision, um, God brings these sheets in front of him in a vision. And there is all sorts of creatures. There is all sorts of animals. And, and believe it or not, all of them were unclean. All of them were to what the Jewish people called um, forbidden to eat or to touch because they were unclean. And they would not dare to go and do anything with any of those animals. And God says, kill and eat. And Peter says, well, God, I will, I will never put such thing in my mouth. But God says that whatever I have created, you cannot call unclean. So it's that theme that it makes root, if you like, here. And we can pick up here to mean that Jesus, I think, very much is bringing that, that um, idea in that as the tree grows, it is going to be one tree which compares with the kingdom of God. The mustard tree, it is like the tree of God's kingdom. It is like the kingdom of God where it will join those who are known to be unclean and those that are clean, irrespective of what, they will become one. And I think that's another very significant part of the um, mustard tree or mustard seed, where Jesus brings, I think, this idea where those things that you called unclean, the birds and the things that were very much part of the mustard seed, were, were put out of the society, were put out of everything, and they were not considered part of the, the life, uh, the society, the, everything that was happening there. Jesus is saying that the, a new era is coming. Within the kingdom of God, it will be like a mustard. It will be a tree which will join those unclean and those who are clean or whatever you may call it, all join into one irrespective of what. And I think that is 
that is what will characterize Israel, the new Israel that Jesus um, speaks about. And, you know, as I was thinking of that, it, it gives us a message. It gives us a message where we may think that there is people, well, we know there is people that are not very likable. We know that there is people that we'd, we'd rather not fellowship with. We find it difficult to fellowship with. And you know that some of the problems that we've been facing worldwide is the difference on um, culture, the difference on, on, on race and so on and so forth. But this message to me brings it home that those that are unlikable are likable by God. Those that you may not think of very highly well, God wants them in his kingdom. Just like he wants you, just like he wants me, God wants them in his kingdom. And if you, if you cannot put up with other people, if you cannot bear to be together, if you cannot find any common thing in life or any other thing that you do around, well, guess what? In the kingdom of God, in that tree that Jesus is bringing, you will be able to join together. The kingdom of God has a way of bringing together everyone for one purpose, to worship him. And I think, I think a message like that, uh, I believe that Jesus was trying to teach and Jesus wants to teach us. And it gives us that understanding that we need to work on ourselves pick up, strengthen ourselves, push ourselves to pray, even for those that we do not like. To bear in mind, even those people that um, we might find difficult to be around, or even those people that we have nothing in common with, those are people that God wants. God wants all to come to his kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus uh, picks up again with a yeast, if you like, or leaven, whichever translation you, you, you have. There is a twist there as well. Now, throughout the Old Testament, you find that there is history there. And that's where the metaphor comes Leaven, it was known to be used as a metaphor, yeast, it is known to be used as a metaphor for sin. So for instance, um, because of its size of yeast that you use to make the bread, it's very small compared to the three portions or whatever um, size of um, flour that you use. It's very small compared to it all. And it's one of those examples that um, yeast often is, is used as a metaphor of sin. So we, we examine ourselves and we do not let these little sin that we have, every little fall that we may have, that we examine ourselves and we do not let them um, come in. Because once we open the door for a little bit, then pretty much it becomes like a highway. And um, um, big sins come into our life and we get into trouble. So it becomes like a stronghold and so on and so forth. So it's, it's the power, like a gateway to a great a power of the greater sin into our life. And leaven is, is used on, on those metaphors, if you like. But also we know for the Feast of Passover, Jews um, were commanded actually to uh, remove all the yeast leaven uh, around their house and not have it. Um, for their feast of the unleavened bread and so on and so forth. Um, they were commanded in the book of Exodus. If you have time, go search it up and you will find. But um, in, normal, in a normal um, year, if you like, the rest of the year, they really enjoyed it because, you know, the yeast makes the bread all fluffy and soft and lovely and beautiful. And you can enjoy that comfort, you know. Um, but for those times that they um, celebrated the Passover. They took the yeast out and, and um, 
The bread without yeast was tough and it reminded them of the hardship in life that they had. It reminded them that in time of um, Egypt, when they had to run away, they did not have time to wait for the yeast to make the bread to um, come and um, to grow, if you like. So they had to make it and eat like that, hard, tough, uncomfortable, if you like. And also they had bitter herbs, which reminded them of the slavery and, 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 and the bitterness that was there as well. But Jesus here uses the yeast in a positive way. He uses the yeast um, in, in this parable, uh, which it mirrors, if you like, the mustard seed. He uses the yeast as it's being the tiny portion compared to the three measures of bread, or as I said before, um, which is a small ingredient in itself. And, um, you know, that little uh, amount of yeast, when given chance, it makes the way through all the bread. And that just puffs up, makes it beautiful. It makes it strong. It makes it com comfort to eat. And it's lovely indeed, tasty and all of that. Um, so I think it comes to that point where we mentioned at the beginning where um, Jesus is saying that we can start great things with small beginnings. And I think he's mentioning that yeast on that aspect of it all. And if you look into the other parables, um, Jesus magnifies different areas when it comes to the kingdom of God. But I simply want to conclude a little bit here now. Um, Jesus clearly speaks and he says to all of his hearers and to us that there will be a kingdom. There will be a kingdom of God. But it will not be a great kingdom as the world knows it, or a worldly kingdom. It will not have the splendor as the kingdoms in this world expect to have. It actually will start fairly small. It started with Jesus and it started with a common fisherman. That's how the kingdom started. It didn't start with splendor. Or, or, or glory yet but instead it started with hard work it, it, with discipleship even rejection and the bearing of the cross but there will be a time all oh, will there be a time where we will all see the splendor of the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven as Matthew puts it and at that time, the kingdoms that we see in the world today would be but common pearls, if you like. You know, Luther had a saying. He says, let goods and kindreds go. This mortal life go as well. The body they can kill. All this is rendered to dust in comparison to what is to come. And what Jesus um, basically is trying to say to everyone is that we are called to preach the gospel. We are called to evangelize, to pray for others. I mean, Matthew 28 Right in it, towards the end, what does it say? It says, Go throughout the world, baptize, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Brothers and sisters, the message that we have has 
as the parable says it there, has a hidden treasure. Has a hidden treasure which we share with other people. And when other people explore that hidden treasure, which is within the message, the word of God, is where they will be found, is where they will want to join into this tree of God's kingdom, if you like, where everyone is united together. It is God's calling, it is God's heart that we all pick up, that we all encourage each other to love one another, to respect one another, to pray for those who need Jesus, because everyone needs salvation, and to evangelize wherever we can the good news of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May God bless us and may God strengthen us. May God strengthen us as we go ahead in the days, in the weeks, in the months ahead of us. And may we not neglect the opportunity when it presents itself to bless other people with this hidden message, with this hidden treasure of salvation that we all can take part, become part of God's kingdom, irrespective of culture, irrespective of um, race, place, wherever, language, whatever we are, God wants us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. May the Lord bless you all and may he keep you safe. You will see in the coming weeks, I'm going to take a, um, a break, a small break from preachings and you will see some um, other preachings coming up from various people. And I pray that they will bless you. Um, but I will come back soon. And I look forward to um, seeing you again. But God bless you for now. And uh, keep safe. And we'll see you soon again. Bye for now.